Hello, we're the Northeast Autism Society. Um, even though the charity has been going for 42 years, um, we're still learning um, and developing. And one of the things we want to know more about is masking. And that's what we're going to be uh, talking about this week. Here we have uh, three guests who have looked into the subject a lot to help us. Um, so if we could just introduce them, I'll start with Kieran Rose, who uh, writes and blogs as the Autistic Advocate. Thank you, Julie. It's lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Kieran Rose, as you said, and I'm an Autistic Advocate. I am a researcher and consultant and trainer and uh, have been fighting for the rights of autistic people for a number of years now. Great. Thank you. Amy. Hi, I am Dr. Amy Pearson. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sunderland. Um, I'm also a late identified autistic adult um, and I have worked previously with the Northeast Autism Society and also with Kieran um, collaborating on various bits of research which you'll probably hear about today. Thank you and we also have Jodie Smitten who is a practitioner who supports autistic children, families and schools. Jodie would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah hi uh, thanks for having us. Um, I'm a uh autistic ADHD late diagnosed adult, um, also parent to three neurodivergent children, um, <clears throat> deliver various different talks and training and support families around the country to uh, advocate for their children's needs, mainly within education, uh, but also offer some parenting support. And just completed my master's in autism uh, with my dissertation focused on, on masking in autistic children. So my name's Julie. Um, I joined the Northeast Autism Society about a month ago. I have an autistic son who's 25 now. Um, but while he was growing up, we didn't really know about masking. Um, and it's not something I've ever discussed with him until recently. And that's largely through reading the kind of things that you're writing and blogging about. Um, so for somebody who's perhaps not familiar with the concept or the term, um, let's start with discussing what is autistic masking. And if I could just ask uh, Amy to, to start us off on that. Fantastic. So I was I was hoping you would go to Kieran because I think Kieran has a, a really great answer for this. Um, but we very much sing from the, the same hymn book. So masking is it's a really complex concept. So to kind of break it down to the simplest definition, it is the suppression either consciously or unconsciously. So you might be aware that you're doing it or not aware that you're doing it, but suppressing or hiding aspects of your identity or amplifying aspects of your identity, which I think Kieran will probably talk about a little bit later on this morning, um, in order to either pass in social situations as perhaps non-autistic, or to make it less likely that people might recognise that you're autistic, or to keep yourself safe and avoid stigma associated with being an autistic person in a majority non-autistic society. Thank you. Kieran, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, Amy, Amy's covered that perfectly, I think. <clears throat> but the uh, the um, probably the part that I would emphasise, which Amy alluded to, is is there's a conception at the moment that it's, it's all about hiding being autistic or appearing more neurotypical. Um, where actually a lot of my thinking recently has been more about a notion that I call projecting acceptability, where it's about meeting the needs and expectations of the people around you and your 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 mask moulding itself to whatever that might look like. Right. OK. Um, so is it something that uh, somebody would do unconsciously or consciously? It developmentally, um, it, it, it's a process that grows as you as you grow older. Um, so there are aspects of it which start out as conscious decisions and remain conscious throughout your life. There's a surface behaviour, but it's a bit like that that um, twee analogy of the iceberg. And um, there's much more going on underneath that are unconscious processes, um, and it's it's those ones that are the ones that really kind of need to be picked out because. Surface behaviour you can change, you can modify, but it's the, the stuff that's underneath that really needs to be identified. Right, okay. And Amy, you mentioned um, 
somebody wanting to feel safe. Um, why would they not feel safe? And why do they need to mask? So one of the things that Q and I have found recently in some research that we've been doing is that a huge number of autistic people experience victimization across a lifespan. Some of this is classified as childhood bullying, so being picked on by peers, but some of this is, is really nefarious and personal victimization as well that occurs from people we might classify as friends, family members, um, or people that we have intimate relationships with. And when victimization occurs within these relationships, it leads to us kind of taking the idea that there must be something negative or bad about who we are and internalizing that, so starting to believe it ourselves. It might not be something that you consciously talk about with other people, but it starts to mold how you think about who you are. And that leads to people then suppressing aspects of themselves in order to avoid further victimization. So thinking about the things that people might have picked on them for or might have abused them for and trying to keep that to a minimum so that other people don't do that in future. So we found in our research that people describe masking as a survival strategy rather than just a social thing. It wasn't just something that allowed them to fit in in social situations. It was something that made them feel like they might be able to maintain some safety when they're interacting with others. And in right, okay. Um, and is it something that um, that you do or that you've noticed um, your children doing? Um, is it something that all autistic people do to some extent? Can I just ask Jodie that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it is so complex. Like Amy's already said, um, that there's aspects of masking for me personally that are coming out all of the time that I didn't even realise was there. Um, something that came up just yesterday, uh, I posted um, on my Facebook page about parenting and talked about how previously when I was really masked, um, I parented in a way you know in public I parented in a way that was much more about other people's perceptions of my parenting than my children's needs and as I was typing I was like oh my gosh this is masking I, I was I was masking because I was concerned about other people's judgments and them thinking negatively of me or my children um so this there's so many aspects it, it impacts so many aspects of your life like every aspect of your life um that you know ev do all autistic people mask? Um, I would probably argue yes. I can't obviously speak for everybody. Um, I think there's so much of it that is unconscious. I certainly had no idea that I was masking until I was given the label of what masking is. Um, and that's certainly something that came up massively when I spoke to young people is that it was that light bulb moment when they heard about what masking was, when they read about what masking was, when somebody explained what masking was, they were like, oh my gosh, I've been, I've been doing that forever. Didn't realise that it wasn't something that everybody did to the level that they did. I can imagine. Amy? So I think the last thing that Geordie said there absolutely perfectly led into what I wanted to say, which was that everybody masks, whether autistic or not, everybody modifies how they appear in social situations and shows different parts of themselves depending on what the context is and who we're interacting with. So, you know, I might appear slightly different at work to how I appear at home um, or around really close friends and family. So we all monitor our identities, but marginalised people, whether they be autistic um, or black or from another racial or ethnic minority group, um, or whether they might be LGBTQIA+, have to hide really core aspects of themselves for different reasons. So it isn't just to switch context and appear more flexible based on our social interactions, but to maintain safety within those social interactions, which I think is really important. We all mask to a degree, but some people are masking different things and things which have more of a kind of a really strong impact on their own identity. Thank you, Amy. Kieran? Yeah, just to just to follow up from that as well. So um, another thing that differentiates it from the the kind of average human behavior, the average context switching that, that Amy's just described there is 
outside of social situations, the mask carries on as well. So it isn't just a situational thing, although I see it can be situational aspects of it. Um, when it's something that you do developmentally and it's something that you grow up with, it's something that's with you all the time and it's something that you're doing all the time and there are even times when you're you would think that you are in a safe space like at home where maybe you would think you could be more authentic and 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 drop the mask to a degree if you want to use that kind of terminology but even there there are elements of yourself that are so suppressed that they don't come forward they're not there and it's so it's there's very much a there is a narrative of kind of when when autistic people talk about masking there's a people say well everybody masks and this is just human behavior and yes to a degree but there are elements there which are not everyday human behavior because of that marginalization because of that stigma and just but i know jody wants to add something now i just want to throw something else in as well that Amy talks at the beginning about um, things like bullying and interpersonal victimization, and that can look like many, many different things, and it isn't always deliberate acts as well. When you are autistic and your experience, particularly around communication and sensory uh, information and things and the way that you react to sensory information are very not mainstream. So as a child, if you express needs around those things, quite often because other people don't experience those things, it's very easy for them to dismiss them. So you're invalidated. And when that happens on a continuous level as you grow older, you learn to suppress those things as well because people don't believe you. And you learn not to listen to your own body as what your body's telling you as well. You kind of lose sight of who you are in that way. And I'm going to shut up now because I've monologued for ages and Jodie wants to say something. <laughs> okay I've learned to write notes of what I needed to say or wanted to say so it doesn't get lost um just going back to what Kieran was saying about when you get into those safe spaces that you um you do have a loss of self so you do continue that um that sort of unconscious front but there's also that that slightly more conscious thing for me where even when I'm in safe spaces not so actually almost not at all now but when I'm when I'm at home and um, there would be times where there were those shoulds well you know I, I I I should be like this or I shouldn't be like this because of the stigma attached to um my authentic self in it, it it was quite a conscious it was quite a um I I, sh- I I shouldn't be presenting like this or I shouldn't be um um allowing my children to be like this or um because that that's not the outside neurotypical way of being. Uh, so it was like a, a, a constant internal, I um, can't think of the word, battle really, between what my authentic self and um, how the outside world expects me to be. Right, thank you. Kieran? And then to follow on what Jodie said, because it's a really excellent point, um, when you do get to those kind of safer spaces where you can, you know, the, even when there's Jodie's just really well described there that you're, you know, the, because of and shoulds and I should be acting in this way and stuff, there's also much of that safe space time is taken up with thinking about what's happened when you've not been in the safe space and deconstructing all the conversations that you've had and quite often berating yourself for things that you haven't done or should have done or wish that you had done as well. So there's an element of, of kind of, of self-blame there and internalized ableism and all of those kind of things. And, and again, it's kind of, um, unless you know that this is a process that's happening for you, unless you've got the vocabulary, the words that we're using now, the way to describe this, you don't know what's happening and you just assume that you're broken in some way and there's some fault with you. And then all that does is then reinforce the masking even further because you feel like there's a need that, you know, I now have to cover up my brokenness and work even harder not to be broken or to project, as Amy was saying earlier, kind of, um, you know, to, to exaggerate who you are because that's the expectation that the other people have of you. So you give them what they want to see. It, it, it's again, it's such a complicated thing these are human beings you know we're the most complex creatures on the planet as amy likes to remind me quite often (laughs) absolutely so when you say you're hiding core aspects of yourself what kind of things what what kind of forms does masking take uh perhaps amy 
So it can be hugely varied. It might be things like, so in, in the research, what we've seen is that people talk about things like modifying their facial expressions. You know, we don't necessarily express emotion often in the same ways as neurotypical people, or that might not look the same or as salient. So we might mimic the facial expressions of others, change things like our tone of voice. And that's one of the things that I think often happens very unintentionally. So depending on who you're interacting with, people might mimic the tone of other people, their prosody, so kind of the, the cadence and, and how their voice goes up and down within the sentences that they say. And that might happen very reflexively. So starting to, to mimic how they talk and, and talk in a similar fashion. Um, it might be really superficial things like wearing the same clothes that other people wear or pretending to have the same interests. So pretending to like the same music um, or minimizing how much you talk about your interests so not you know going on a, a massive monologue about you know your favorite tv show or washing machines or whatever it is that you're interested in that thing that really really sparks your passion so those are some of the really kind of I guess basic strategies that are often talked about in the literature um but autistic people talk about a huge range of things so suppressing stims trying to look really subtle so you know maybe not flapping your hands or moving in in you know kind of bigger ways but doing something really subtle so fidgeting with things or you know carrying small uh, toys or items that you move around with um things like not responding to sensory distress so suppressing that response if there's a really loud noise or a horrible smell or a really bright light you know, kind of trying to keep yourself really neutral and not responding to that so that people don't realise that you're really distressed. Which again links into what Kieran was saying about then starting to ignore your internal signals, which really then starts to impact on how much energy we're able to maintain. So if you are constantly suppressing how you feel and starting to ignore those signs telling you that you're getting distressed, you A, don't recognise that you're getting distressed, but B, spend more energy than you have, which means people start to get really exhausted and potentially experience things like burnout. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, a long list there. Is, is there anything, Kieran or Jodie, that you would like to add to that? Uh, I suppose I would just add that that, can, you know, that completely mirrors uh, the research that I did with young people, children and young people, that it, it's... Um, it's it's very much the same they're taking on that same level of suppression that same level of stress in a much smaller body um from a really really young age is what i've seen children my well kieran talks about it when, when when we've done our masking talk but i've i've seen children mask from preschool age toddler age uh so that level of suppression particularly those internal suppressions and um, which i think is so often missed um so what you know there was there was so much about previous research has been so so much about uh people hiding their autism that they haven't actually there's not been enough talk about the internal suppression which got talked about quite a lot by the young people i spoke to in, in that suppression of um internal distress internal emotions internal upset uh and sometimes that is about the invalidation that they've received before because somebody else hasn't had the same experiences them uh and sometimes it's you know it also there's so many of us that are people pleasers fauners and not wanting to be a burden and that's particular particularly an issue for young people in schools where they don't they don't want to stand out within a classroom and um, they don't they don't want to be picked out by the teacher or have to have to leave the room or because then you know that that brings on them all sorts of social demands with well, what's wrong why are you leaving the room um so it, it you know it just adds to the complexities of it really 